Welcome to this episode of Eureka. We are going to have a very interesting conversation with the Director of National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Dr. Pato Madhumdar. One of the questions that have been uh, asked by humans forever is, where do we come from? What about India? Are we coming from one lineage or many? Conversation with him will enlighten us. But before that, let's take a brief profile about him. Dr. Partha P. Majumdar has done his MSc and PhD in Statistics from Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata. His outstanding work on the amalgamation of statistics and biology has won him various accolades. His studies majorly focus on human evolution, population structure, susceptibilities to diseases, responses to drugs and vaccines. Dr. Majumdar has been conferred distinguished honours for his contribution in the field of science and research. He has also held various eminent positions in the scientific fraternity. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, being with us in the show. I'll start with one of your uh, recent paper, which is uh, kind of uh, making waves in the uh, scientific community, particularly people who are studying population uh, genomics. That's your recent paper on uh, July 28th. We all know that uh, there has been some admixture of Neanderthal uh, homing on modern uh, human population. And you, this paper claims that perhaps there is an unknown homing's uh, admixture on Andaman population. Can you elaborate on this? So yes, so let me, let me go back in time a little bit. As we know that uh, uh, modern humans, we all evolved in Africa. But uh, we evolved from archaic humans uh, when we became, when we started walking on two feet um, as opposed to four feet knuckle walking. Um, we evolved from archaic humans who were bipedals and as they evolved over a period of time, modern humans evolved about uh, 80,000 years ago and we all evolved in Africa. Prior to um, us, these archaic humans, they came out of Africa and had populated other parts of the world. So when we came out of Africa, let's say about 50,000 years ago, we did meet with these other archaic humans who are called hominins, who are our ancestors. And there were two theories that were uh, floating around. One is that we were able to master the environment better, we reproduced better, and so we probably killed out the archaic humans because they suddenly got exterminated from the face of this earth. The other was that we actually mixed with them, we interbred with them and we assimilated them in the modern humans. So over the last 10 or 20 years there has been accumulation of evidence that says that these archaic humans actually interbred with the modern humans and we can find the genes of the archaic humans in the genomes of the modern humans. Okay. So there were two essentially two archaic human species whose genomes were, uh, we were able to find. One is the Neanderthal, the other is called the Denisovan, uh, and they were archaic humans whose remnants were found in a cave in Siberia, and then DNA analysis proved that they were different from the, uh, Deniso different from the Neanderthals, and their uh, genomes were also found in the human genomes. We have recently been able to find that there was not only the Neanderthal and the Denisovan, there probably was another third uh, archaic ancestral species that contributed to our genomes and that's the find that we provided uh, in this paper that we have recently published in Nature Genetics. The uh, other area that uh, you have been uh, kind of famous, I mean like one of your paper which was published about more than two decades ago, somewhere around uh, 1994 or something like that in uh, Current Science, yes. uh, which talked about uh, the uh, population of India, yes. the lineages from which uh, the Indian population comes. Yes. Can you elaborate something? So uh, essentially the paper that you are talking about that was published many years ago, uh, that was done on the basis of a specific kind of genome called the mitochondrial genome that we analyzed at that time. Mitochondrial genome is within the cell but outside of the nucleus of the cell. The nucleus of the cell harbors most of the uh, DNA material. It, it's outside of the nucleus of the cell and we analyzed those genomes, uh, the mitochondrial genomes in multiple populations of India. The, incidentally, the mitochondrial genome is inherited from the mother to all her children, by all her children. So, which means, for example, the mitochondrial DNA I have yes. is coming from my mother. Yes. But yeah. whereas my nuclear DNA, 
half of it come from a mother and half come from correct father. absolutely yeah. correct so when we are looking at mitochondrial dna we are actually tracking female lineage yeah. and what we were able to show in that paper is that the female lineage or the mitochondrial dna molecule even though there was a little bit of uh, some amount of diversity but we found that there was a fundamental unity in all of these mit mitochondrial dna lineages uh, so that was that paper. Subsequently, we went on to study various populations, but we graduated and we looked at the nuclear genome because after all, that's the major DNA content in the human genome. And when we analyzed, uh, um, you know, different po ethnic populations, one of the fundamental questions that we asked is, uh, after all, we must have different kinds of ancestors. Now, could it be one ancestor? Could it be two ancestors? Could it be more than two ancestors? And the recent paper that I have done or uh, the recent work that I have done with a colleague of mine, Dr. Anil Basu, essentially what we have been able to show is that if you analyze the genomes of all of the people of India uh, that, are, that are congregated in various ethnic groups, you find that in mainland India there are four lineages and these four lineages are identifiable with the four major language groups that are there in India and a fifth lineage that is there in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So the Andaman and Nicobar Islands was peopled by a separate lineage and uh, the mainland India was essentially peopled by four different ancestral lineages. What are those uh, four ancestral lineages which you think uh, is uh, connected to the four major uh, language groups in the so, mainland? So if you, if you look at these four lineages, you can identify them with the North Indian groups who speak the Indo-European languages or the, or the Indo-Aryan languages. The, uh, it's yeah. essentially the same. If you look at the southern populations, uh, they are they have a, they belong to a southern uh, ancestral southern Indian group who speak Dravidian languages. If you look at northeast of India, they speak a language called Tibeto-Burman, and that lineage is different from the uh, Indo-European or the Dravidian language uh, lineage. And then we have a fifth uh, um, line, um, we have a fourth lineage language lineage in India, which is spoken exclusively by some tribal populations of India called the Austro-Asiatic lineage. The Austro-Asiatic lineage is fairly ancient in India, but that's a separate lineage altogether, separate from the remaining three lineages. That's very interesting. So uh, there have been two major studies by you, one looking at the mitochondrial DNA, the other looking at the nucleic DNA, and then uh, this is a kind of uh, results that you get yes, out of it. Right? Yes. So if you look at your mitochondrial study, it says there is a basic unity underlying whatever variation that you see yes. apparently that uh, in some sense, in matrilineal sense, we all share the common uh, Correct. origin Correct. or a uh, common uh, lineage. But if you look at the nuclear uh, DNA, we see that there are uh, four major uh, lineages in the mainland and the fifth one in uh, yes. Andaman. Yes. How do you put them together? So there is uh, no contradiction at all because uh, what we believe is that when the females came into India, it was a smaller group of females. The males came into India possibly multiple in multiple waves. So uh, like I said, that the mitochondrial DNA is essentially tracking a female lineage. So if it was a small number of females who came into India, obviously one expects a fundamental genome. So uh, in some ways, maternally, we are very homogeneous, but paternally, or if you consider the nuclear genome, where, like you said, 50-50 contribution from, from the two parents, we are more diverse. Having said that, you know, our work has also got sometimes very bad press. Mm -hmm. I wake up one morning and see in the newspaper headlines, your caste in, is in your genes, says Partha Majumdar. And that's completely wrong. The caste is not written in the genes. Essentially, what we are trying to figure out is an ancient human, human evolution. That has nothing to do with uh, caste per se. Caste is a cultural construct. It, has, it may or may not have, may, may or may not go hand in hand uh, with the genes and in, in India it certainly doesn't go hand in hand with the genes. Even though there are, uh, you know, some amount of diversity between castes and we can distinguish two castes based on their overall genomic profiles, this does not necessarily mean that caste is written in the genes. So the interpretation has to be carefully done. All of our work stems from the basic interest that humankind has, where do we come from? That is what we are trying to uh, really figure out and answer. Interesting. Where do we come from? That's one major scientific question that is being addressed by uh, our guest today, Pato Majumdar. We'll continue this discussion, but we'll have a small break. And after the break, we are going to discuss about, is it merely knowledge or is it going to have some application? We'll uh, continue this discussion after the break. Welcome to this episode of Eureka. And we are with us, Dr. P. Mazumdar, 
director of national institute of biomedical genomics you are also engaged in activities which perhaps will have uh, immediate uh, contribution to the society you know uh, biomedical genomics yes. how do you see the relationship between the kind of uh, theoretical work that you are doing and some practical application this is this is really a wonderful question so let me address uh, this question by bringing to the fore some of the work that we are doing in the area of cancer. Um, so let me again give, give you a little bit of a perspective to our cancer research, our major cancer research. Uh, in 2009, the world came together to look at cancer or to understand cancer. Uh, cancer today is, uh, by, uh, you know, by, by our current understanding, is a completely genetic disease. It does not necessarily mean that it gets transmitted from one generation to another, but if you look at, at the cellular level, there is always a DNA change that precipitates cancer. So in the sense of the DNA, cancer is a completely genetic disease. When we are trying to establish certain gene variants and associate that with cancer of different kinds, uh, we do find that there are gene variants associated. And the idea is to find out what specific gene variants or what specific changes or alterations in the DNA drive a cell to gaining this huge uh, growth advantage that it becomes a tumor and, uh, and, and a malignant tumor. There are, as you know, cancer is not a homogeneous disease. There are different organs that get afflicted by cancer. Different kinds of organs uh, um, get afflicted in different parts of the world. In India, oral cancer is uh, the maximally prevalent form of cancer among males in India. Uh, among females, it's uh, cervical cancer, but breast cancer is taking over. So when the world came together to understand different types of cancer, uh, India decided to participate as a founding member of the International Cancer Genome so Consortium. So what you are saying is that uh, the scientists around the world are coming together Have to come take, together. Ch take this challenge of uh, facing cancer. Right? Yes, yeah. yes. Good. To uh, take the challenge of understanding cancer and this understanding we believe will uh, lead to treatments to first to diagnosis, then to prediction of prognosis and then eventually to treatment. This is what our belief is. India decided to participate in this consortium with oral cancer as the mainstay. So what we have been doing is to look at the kind of DNA alterations that drives a cell to becoming an oral cancer tissue eventually. In doing so, what we need to do is to also ask this question, supposing we find a DNA alteration in a cancer tissue, is, this, uh, is it because of that DNA alteration that the cell has become malignant or is it just an innocuous DNA variant that's found in a large number of people, has nothing to do with cancer. The, these kinds of DNA alterations happen in the background. So these are called passenger variants. I mean, it has nothing to do uh, prim predom primarily with cancer. It's How like, for example, uh, when you grow old, you have a gray hair, right. but it's not the gray hair which is making you Correct. Old. Correct. That's, a, that's a kind of uh, That's yeah. a kind of analogy. So in order to identify which particular DNA variants are actually passengers, have nothing to do with cancer, we need population data. We need population data on the kind of DNA variants that exist uh, just in the population as a, as a general rule. So to be able to understand a specific DNA alteration, whether it is associated or causes cancer, we need population data. So this idea that we had that essentially where do we come from is the question that we are trying to answer. In trying to answer that question, we have also generated huge amounts of population genetic data. The kind of normal uh, variation that is there in populations across India and these data now feed into these kinds of biomedical genomic approaches that we are taking in order to understand different diseases. In India, among the males, for example, the uh, oral cancer is the uh, predominant. Yes. Uh, is it to do with, for example, substance abuse, like for example, uh, tobacco and things like that? Or you think that beyond tobacco, there is something mystery and that's why it's an important question? So uh, the, the point is you're right that uh, people who have oral cancer are invariably tobacco users. But not all tobacco users get oral cancer, right? It's only about 10% of tobacco users who eventually uh, go on to form oral cancer. So there is, of course, an environmental link, but there is more to it, which is that, is it possible that there are genomes that are more vulnerable to the assault of these various kinds of environmental carcinogens? And that's precisely uh, what, what the relationship is uh, between the interaction between uh, genes and environment, which is which comes to the fore with diseases that are impacted on by the environment, such as 
uh, oral cancer by use of tobacco. But we also need to understand how it interacts with the host genome, the individual who is actually using the tobacco. Yeah, interesting. Uh, till now, kind of we were discussing about the kind of question that you are personally interested and uh, you have been working on and uh, carrying on your research. But now you are also heading a National Institute for Biomedical Genomics which also looks at somewhat similar issues. So what other kinds of challenges are you as an institution taking up? So uh, but let, me, let me also tell you this, that uh, this institute uh, was, a, was an idea that uh, Wallace only about five years ago. And uh, these, uh, the seeding of these ideas came from me and I was asked to um, you know, establish this institute and that's what I've been doing for the last five or six years. Um, I obviously, for lack of time, I can't present to you all of the work that's been uh, that's going on right now. Uh, we are a large number of faculty. Well, not large, but we are about 15 faculty members right now. We have a, a whole bunch of PhD students and so on. So I can't obviously touch upon the work of um, each of the faculty members. But let me just point out two of the works that we are doing. One has to do with uh, infectious disease and the other has to do with chronic disease. So let me start with the chronic disease first. So uh, if we look at livers of um, uh, individuals, liver is a very important organ in the body. Unfortunately, the liver also accumulates fat. And this accumulation of fat eventually uh, can lead to cirrhosis, can lead to liver cancer. Uh, this, is, this is the progression that happens in, in a subset of individuals. So what we ask is why, do, why does the liver accumulate fat and in a subset of individuals where the liver has accumulated fat, why do they go on to produce cirrhosis and eventually to liver cancer and we have reasons to believe that genomes of these individuals are See, involved. See but uh, one of the general uh, you know, view would be that uh, alcoholism leads yes. to uh, uh, deposition of fat in the yes, liver, right? Yes, you're I mean, completely right. You're completely right that alcohol, uh, consumption of alcohol leads to deposition of fat in the liver. So this entity that we are looking at, this phenotype that we are looking at is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So which so, means you are looking at uh, people whose liver is getting deposited with fat, but they are not uh, habitual drinkers. Correct, absolutely right. In India, a friend of mine uh, Dr. Abhijit Choudhury, who works in the um, uh, SSKM hospital here, a very famous hepatologist, he discovered some years ago that uh, even people in the villages of India who are usually lean, oftentimes malnourished, and have no fat in the body, they have huge amounts of fat in the liver. So it presents, in India it presents without obesity. So there is no association um, of obesity and uh, fat in the liver even though they are non-habitual alcohol um, users. So what we thought is that there may be certain kinds of different biological pathways that are acting in lean individuals who go on to develop fat in the liver and this is what we are, this is one major research that we are doing in the institute right now. Incidentally, the institute has also spawned a biomedical genomic center in the uh, courtyard of a hospital, a large ter tertiary care hospital in Calcutta, which is called uh, the, uh, the SSKM hospital. So we right now have another uh, biomedical genomic center um, in the, on the premises of the SSKM hospital and this Looking case at was, this uh, liver. Yes. This, you this said is that the, uh, two major, one is you said chronic. Yes, the so other is infectious, so we are also looking at various kinds of infectious diseases, but I will tell you one major problem that we are trying to resolve, which is in tuberculosis. Tuberculosis uh, is, is a major problem, continues to and be a major currently problem. Currently, your institute here. is uh, located in a tuberculosis. Uh, Correct. Yeah. So right now, we are located on the floor of a tuberculosis sanitarium. Um, sanitarium doesn't exist, but it's essentially a hospital that treats uh, uh, tuberculosis patients. So in tuberculosis, one of the thing, one of the observations is that people, um, when they are treated with these uh, various kinds of uh, medicines, they get cured. The, the infection uh, goes away. But in a subset of patients, the bug, the, the pathogen hides in the lung, and I'm talking about pulmonary tuberculosis, lung tuberculosis. The uh, bug hides in the lung in the form of what's called a granuloma. And the gran usually the immune system of the body gets rid of these pathogens, but when granuloma forms, the immune system is unable to detect the bug because it is hiding like inside a coconut. So it forms a coconut shell and it, uh, it's hiding inside the coconut. So the immune system is unable to detect. When there is no circulating pathogen, the immune system goes to sleep. When the immune system goes to sleep, these bugs, the pathogens inside the coconut, they realize, inside the granuloma, they realize that 
you know, the immune system is not, uh, uh, there is no immune surveillance, so we can wake up and reinfect the individual. So, they reinfect the individual. Once the individual gets reinfected with tuberculosis, the per person then goes on to infect other individuals. So, the question that we are asking is, why is it that a subset of individuals produce granulomas while most others don't? And so, if we can characterize this subset, maybe we can avoid reinfection and therefore spread of the disease. Uh, so, this is what we have been looking at and very recently we have found some um, genetic handles on why some individuals develop these granulomas. So, that those, those, are, those are the kinds of uh, work that we do in the institute. Essentially, the institute looks at genomic underpinnings of various kinds of diseases, infectious, non-infectious, chronic, everything. We will continue our conversation after this break. After the break, we will discuss how we came to this exciting field. We'll take a small break. Don't go. Welcome to this episode of Eureka. We are having a very interesting conversation with the director of National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Dr. P. Majumdar. Here you are heading a biomedical genomics institution and coming from statistics. I'm sure all our audience are uh, amazed, flabbergasted, mystified. Can you explain? So, um, again, like uh, I graduated from school, I was uh, interested in mathematics. I think I was reasonably good in mathematics. Uh, wrote the exam entrance examination of the Indian Statistical Institute, passed the exam, joined the Indian Statistical Institute. Once I got into the Indian Statistical Institute, the syllabus was very funny. Um, of course, there was a, 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 a huge dose of mathematics and statistics. But along with mathematics, mathematics and statistics, we had to study various kinds of life sciences, earth sciences, social sciences and physical sciences. Earth sciences, social sciences and physical sciences. Yes, all, all of them. All of yeah, them. Yes, okay. all of them. It was not all together, but over a period of time, we, uh, when we joined our Bachelor of Statistics course was four years. Mm -hmm. And this was a mix of all of these sciences. And the reason why this happened is because it was kind of an integrated course. Our uh, founder was a visionary. His name is Prashant Chandra Mahalanobis, the, uh, the founder of uh, the Indian Statistical Institute. He actually believed that statistics cannot thrive uh, in isolation. Th statistics has to thrive along with other sciences and the other sciences will provide the food that is required for statisticians to develop statistical methods and to grow. So it was uh, this kind of an environment that I grew up with. Uh, grew up in and uh, um, genetics as you know uh, is probably the most quantitative of all biological sciences and we had a fair amount of grinding in genetics in the uh, Indian Statistical Institute when we were doing our BSTAT uh, Bachelor of Statistics and Masters of Statistics. That is what I, I guess at the corner of my mind biology was a passion. My father was uh, a biologist. He uh, worked for the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute. So science and biology was at home. So Somewhere at the corner of my mind, at the corner of uh, my heart was biology. So after I graduated, I decided to uh, do genetics or um, uh, do full time research in genetics. I quickly realized that I was uh, analyzing other people's data when in fact I had my own questions to ask. But I did not have the wherewithal, I did not have the um, appropriate training in order to get into the lab and do uh, wet lab experiments myself. So I spent a few years in the United States and a very good friend who was a biochemist who allowed me to use his lab uh, and, and learn techniques. So, so that's what I did. I spent a few years in the United States teaching, doing research, but at the same time spending a substantial portion of my time doing wet lab experiments. And I also um, you know, um, sat through various undergraduate and graduate courses in biochemistry, cell biology, molecular biology, and so on and so forth. So uh, those few years in the United States provided me with the training that I needed to start thinking about uh, experimental biology. And after I came back to India, uh, I was able to get uh, you know, enough support from the Indian Statistical Institute from the Department of, Bio Department of Biotechnology uh, to be able to set up a wet lab, uh, a human genetics wet lab DNA sequencing lab at the Indian Statistical Institute and there was uh, actually no looking back. So that was wonderful. Let me move to another question. Now you are heading a very major national institute and you have had more than four decades of uh, research and teaching experience in science. If I ask you, what are the three major challenges science is facing today in India, what would you describe them as? 
uh, in India, you said, yes, one major challenge is that our density of scientists is very low. So that's one major challenge. The second major challenge is that uh, we are asked to be global and oftentimes uh, we have the capability of being global or competing globally, but the kind of money that's required for modern biology is very high. And if you want to do modern biological research and compete globally, then the money has to stream in. And oftentimes, you know, the, the, the streaming in of money doesn't happen smoothly. It happens in bursts and that, that is a major handicap. The third major handicap is, has to do with uh, the younger generation that's joining, coming into India. They are enticed to come back, but oftentimes the facilities that are required for them to uh, pursue research full-fledged um, go gung-ho about research and you know, do, do uh, contribute to science in a big way. That is becoming a major problem. Um, uh, in terms of jobs, it ain't there. In terms of uh, infrastructure and other kinds of facilities for them to pursue research, uh, I think we do have a challenge and I think uh, that needs to be addressed. The over overall quantum of science budget isn't increasing, yet new projects are starting, new institutions are starting. Um, so uh, while we are able to make you know, some jobs available, but these are jobs of scientists. I mean, they are supposed to do research. They are supposed to be given certain kinds of uh, infrastructure and funds for pursuing the research. And uh, that really is a challenge. And I think uh, uh, the science budget really needs to increase in a, in a big way. Of course, I realize that every aspect of human society in India requires more money. But, you know, I work in the area of science, so I'm going to plead with our government, with our prime minister, with our president, wherever, uh, give us a little bit more money to do uh, science so that our younger generation can pursue good, good science and um, compete globally. We are having a very interesting conversation and there may be many questions that I would like to ask and then converse with, but then unfortunately uh, yes, our I time agree. is limited. So we need to end this program here. But then thank you for being with us uh, in this program and then we had a very thank interesting you. and enlightening thank you conversation. Much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a very educative and interesting conversation with uh, Dr. Patha Mazumdar, Director of National Institute for Biomedical Genomics. We'll meet with another scientist in our next episode in the next week.